Okay, thank you, Jeremy. I'm happy to actually uh, present to tell you about the research we've been doing in the hub for so many years, I mean, about 10 years now. Now, I'm not really going to review everything, I'm just like, um, how to say, uh, give directions of um, what we've been doing and where we are going to. So this is really this improving durability and expanding cement uh, functionalities. All right, so uh, my next slide is here. There you go. Right, so this is the hub. I mean, about that. 10 years, hey, uh, I'm very much interested in what is the cement base itself. Uh, so what I mean, what we discovered and what people agree on is that this is a multi-scale uh, porous material starting from the nano scale up. So the, we do, do have nanopores, so that means in which water, for instance, and iron are kind of uh, uh, locked. And also bigger pores, as we're going to see in a minute. And this is in those series of the big, uh, bigger pores that we call the capillary pores that the, the problem of cement, the uh, degradation of cement do, uh, do occur. So uh, the idea was really to provide a conceptual science-based frame to, to, to describe cement phase degradation. For instance, it will be uh, freezing throwing and also alkalistic reaction, ASR, and you can also pile up with uh, a train guide, shooting, and so on. Okay, understanding is one thing, and then we can move on into uh, thinking about mitigating those effect, these effects um, and provide a solution uh, about uh, how to prevent cement degradation. And you'll see that on the path of doing this, we discovered some kind of new functionality of cement. So by adding some carbon, just to tell you the story, to cement, we uh, move to a cement that was, uh, okay, cement base to a cement base that, that, that can have some, uh, for instance, uh, um, electricity, electricity storing ability. So that will be a, a new type of, of cement uh, for a new usage. All right. So what we've learned is that cement is out of equilibrium assembly of nanograins. And in between those grains, you have pores. These are called gel pores. At the larger scale, you have bigger cracks or bigger pores that we call capillary pores. So cement base force is CSH, okay? This, copper, I mean, that, that, uh, this is the name of the hub, of course, but this is a calcium silicate hydrate, okay? So it's made of calcium, silicate, and water. So the main idea is that cement base degradation is, is, has to do with something growing in those big capillary pores. This is not something happening at the nanoscale. I mean, you see that there is a nano component of it to understand it, but this is really dealing with what is happening in the big, big pores. Meaning that we need to have a saturation degree of the paste, of the cement paste, uh, at 80% uh, to see some degradation, like uh, FT, for instance. What we discovered mainly is that this is due to the fact that it has to do with ions, or okay, ions swimming into the solution. So, for instance, when you have an ice core, when you have an ice core, when you have an ice core um, into um, uh, growing into the, the pores, then uh, we will have, uh, we'll see that there is a, always a layer, a liquid layer, filled with, I mean, a lot with a lot of ions, and this is where they uh, is developing a disjoining pressure between the ice core, for instance, and the cement paste due to ions. So all degradation of cement, freezing, sawing, ISR, have to do with some swimming ions in this region in between the growing phase in the capillary pores and the CSH. All right, and this is uh, because of those ions that a, a joining pressure, so something that is really during the part of cement is developing. Right. This is the summary of the research over the last 10 years. For instance, we started that 10 years ago with the uh, bottom, I mean, on the bottom right picture of the, the first molecular model of cement based at the nanoscale. I am on the phone. Um, cement based at the nanoscale. And then we can upgrade. Uh, we, we have a, we can see cement as an assembly of grains, as you can see on the on the middle panel here in red. That this is the work due to Amin Jennings that he was with us um, uh, at the, I mean the, on the phase one. And then from the interaction between the grains, we manage actually to produce the, at the top panel the first molecular, the first mesoscale model of cement based. Uh, and the, now the side of the cube at the at the top right 
uh, panel is actually a micron. So we went down from the nanoscale, that the top, the bottom one, up to micron. So now the big curve that is behind is the adsorption isotherm of, of water in cement paste. That is the amount of water that can take uh, go, go into the cement paste as a function of the relative humidity. And this is a comparison between our simulations and some experiments for a cement paste with water to cement ratio of 0.45. Very good. So we actually can print now where the water is going into cement base, how? Because we're actually piling all those modeling from the nanoscale to the mesoscale. So now, now when, once we know where the water is going on, uh, is going into the cement base, then we can actually to start for seeing where, I mean, there the are the problems. So before this, I'd like to give you some uh, kind of first of the kind experiments that we've been doing with our connection in Marseille, in France. This is, for instance, an electron tomography of the cement paste. Uh, so, for instance, the size of the cube here is actually one micron. So it's about the same size as the simulation uh, on, on, the, on the right panel here. You can actually see different densities or different colors, and you also this big crack in between that really much all those capillary pores that we, we've been um, discussing up to now, and this is the location of all the problems of the cement paste. All right, now if we move on to the larger scale, so now this cube, this kind of um, sample here is 60 micron, 60 micron long, 40 uh, by 40 in size, and the, the white is the clinker grain, our clinker grains, the gray are hydration products, CSH mainly, and the black are the pores. So we're going to slice through the sample so that we are at the scale above the, the previous picture, right? So if I were to plot this, uh, to run this plot, this uh, movie, and you see what we actually have. For instance, we have a big clinker grain in the middle of this, uh, this uh, sample here. And now we're going back. And now um, the, 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 the movie is going to select in red only the pores. So these are the big pores because obviously uh, we are at the micron scale now, more than the micron scale, and the resolution is 64 nanometers. So you can see that here, here are those capillary pores, the cracks that I was, uh, we were displaying in the, previous, uh, in the previous slide. You see that this is a, a very connected set of pores in 3D in space. So uh, it actually, if we, we can actually manage to, go to calculate the connectivity of those pores, and we can we come up with a 95% connection. So this is a highly connected system. So now, if I add my own experiment of freezing. So you see on the right, there was a, a kind of San Pellegrino bottle that was in my patio in a very cold winter night uh, here in Boston. And you can see a nice growing cap that actually broke the cap uh, on the bottle remaining, I mean, with the, with, the, with the bottle not cracked actually. And you can see through the bottle, meaning that the water inside is still actually liquid. And from this, we can actually learn that if Ice can grow freely in one direction, say along the pore direction. There is no need to push on the side and break. So this is actually by, by very much by contrast with the current like belief that actually cement will crack because of the expansion of ice. Uh, I mean, compared to liquid water, for instance, ice occupies nine percent more water than, than the liquid. This is not the reason. In this case, we have an, an, a fully connected uh, set of pores so that actually the ice actually can, can actually grow. So we need to understand why there is a degradation mechanism because this is actually observed, right? Okay. Right, so this is, uh, I mean, actually what the industry has been doing for a long time now is to uh, include some air bubbles into, uh, into the cement space. So those air entrained bubbles are ways to mitigate the cement. This is a, a picture that taken from Paulo Montero in Berkeley, and, and actually he got famous for this. When you see, uh, this is a cut, this is a SEM picture, when you see the ice growing from the big pores you know, into, into this uh, entrain bubble. So obviously, this is a way to mitigate the, 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 the freezing problem, right? So let's go to the core of the problem. I thank to you that everything has to do with big pores. So we have a ice core in blue growing up in the big pores, and the, the rest is surrounded by cement. And if you do physical chemistry of those kind of interface system, then you will see that there is always a liquid layer in between the cement and the ice. A liquid of, I mean, liquid water. And what is interesting here is that ice, by definition, if ice, ice is, is growing, then 
it will reject any ion that could be in the solution in, in this little region between the cement and the ice core. Ice doesn't like iron to exist, okay? So this region there is actually getting crowded with ions. And if we do a pressure calculation, like because there's disjoining, disjoining pressure due to ions in this kind of ice cement system, right? Then we can actually find out that this is a very repulsive uh, pressure, meaning a, 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 a disjoining pressure. It's, it's trying to pull up, right, the, the, between the two phases. So, actually, um, this layer has a thickness of one nanometer, so we can actually figure out that the, the pressure is typically on the, on, the, on the scale of 50 MPAs, right, 50, 70 MPAs. So, if you read the, the, the phase diagram of water, which is this uh, uh, bottom left panel here, uh, a 50 pressure on the, on the, on the y-axis corresponds to a, a pressure transition between ice and liquid of minus, uh, minus 7 uh, Celsius. This is typically um, the temperature at which we do observe the cement degradation. So basically the idea is that this pressure is preventing ice forming, fine, to a point. When temperature is cold enough, then the ice will form and this pressure will be transmitted to the CSH phase. Right? And then we, on top of this, we actually did some mesoscale simulation. So we took the same um, micron scale model of, uh, of, of cement paste as the work of, of Katerina Yuanidou. And we could actually um, uh, simulate the growing of ice grains into the spore in a repulsive um, interaction with the cement paste. And we, would, we, we did see uh, the cracking of, of the paste due to ice. But again, it's not because of ice expansion, again, right? It's because there is a disjoining pressure in this in nanoscale layer between the CSH and the ice because ions are swimming in there, okay? And now what's interesting is that the same formalism could be actually applied to alkali silica reaction. So again, now we have an ASR gel coming from aggregates uh, flowing into actually uh, the, the, the mesopore, the, the capillary pores of cement paste. Fine, fair enough. And what actually we did some experiments on those. We nano indent on those on those on, on, on that gel. It's actually very liquidy. She has no mechanical properties. But over time, this actually sodium silica gel coming from the aggregates actually exchanged those sodium ions with some calcium ions coming from the potent for instance, in the cement paste. And doing so, the calcium getting into the ASR gel makes this ASR gel to shrink. It doesn't push on the wall. But at the same time, yeah, the interface, the liquid layer in between the cement and the SR gel is getting rich with sodium ions. And therefore, we develop again the similar pressure as we actually found for, for freezing, uh, the freezing case. So now we have a disjoining pressure because of the exchange of the sodium ions from the ASR gel uh, and the, 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 the intake of calcium. All right. So that's, we have then the same, the same, the same idea there. So that for a long time, nothing is happening. Why? Because the SR gel is actually liquidish and this is sodium there and everything is fine. And then we actually uh, have uh, to um, move away. I mean, to, to include more calcium into, uh, when we include more calcium into the CS3, CS, ASR gel, then the sodium ion gets outside and then we have, uh, we have a, a, a disjoining pressure. All right, so how can we do, uh, what can we do to mitigate those effects? So basically, we have a problem because we have all so many ions uh, that look like swimming into this, into the, into this layer between the, the whatever core and the cement paste because we are in the hydrophilic condition. But those ions creating disjoining pressure that will be the left panel will be on the side. I mean, if the swimming pool is empty, basically, if we make the cement paste hydrophobic. And actually, this is not exactly new in the, in the, in the literature of uh, freezing, sewing for rock mechanics, for instance. For instance, here you have this uh, science paper reporting the pressure induced by salt in, in the pores of rocks for monument preservation. And this is what exactly they, they found out. It's exactly our same conclusion as ours, meaning that there is a wetting film, so a liquid layer between the growing crystal and the confining walls of the rock. And this is in that layer that the pressure actually develop. So, and this is the, the last sentence at the bottom of this little text. If the walls are made hydrophobic, nothing is observed, and multi-force is detected, that's the disjoining pressure, and this is a way to mitigate 
um, uh, free. Okay, effect. Very good. And this is actually something that the industry knows in some kind of uh, empirical way. For instance, people have been trying to use silane like uh, as an external treatment of, of pavement, for instance. Silane is very, very hydrophobic molecule. And actually, that actually is shown to actually significantly uh, prevent uh, freezing sewing effects uh, for, and, and so then preserve the, 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 the pavement. So uh, you don't see uh, no more surface scaling and, and so on in the presence of, of obviously uh, the icing salt. All right, so in our, in our case, actually, we found another way to make the pores of cement, the capillary pores of cement paste, hydrophobic. We found out that thing by adding to cement paste for nanoporous grain of carbon. Okay, nice because I'm sure this is economically viable. Okay, the mix is okay. I mean, we have, a, we have the same kind of value of uh, both uh, components. And what's interesting is that we don't lose any mechanical properties. Actually, actually, we improve them because we are actually feeling the capital force with the cement. So the art was actually in, a dis in dispersing the, 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 the nano grains of carbon into the same place. So we manage. And then here is a, this is a, an ICM picture. So you see the scale. The scale is about 100 nanos. This is a little uh, white uh, uh, line on the, on, the, on, the, on the bottom right of the picture. And actually, you have to believe me, but this is the, the, the nano grain of carbon, all those little, little little grains that are in the in this red circle the rest the rest are more like white type of thing are more like um, rcsh actually so you see in fact we have enough porous carbon grains to create a percolation path inside the cement paste okay so now we can zoom in into and see uh that's this is now a, a, a tm picture so we are going down in the resolution Here you see the 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 the, the the, the, the 200 nano uh, reference scale here. And you see on the right, this is the nano grains uh, of, of, uh, of porous carbon that is stuck or an interaction, is somehow weak interaction with the, the CSH, which is typically the phase on the left of the picture. Okay. Now, this is our sample. So you can see that we can store them forever into the kind of a cylindrical a little uh, shape there. And what we found actually is that those carbon loaded cement paste are actually samples are able to conduct electricity. Why? Because there is enough of carbon in the paste to create a path uh, to, ca to carry electrons because those carbons are made of a special case of, I mean, if you look at the chemistry of carbon, it's called sp2 carbon. This is the hybridization. So now we are really much into the, the quantum state of carbon, if you like. And actually those carbon having three neighbors, like in graphite, for instance, and this is the case of those uh, nanoporous carbons, those carbon with three neighbors are able to conduct electricity. So now, because we have a percolation path of those carbon grains into the cement paste, then we have a conducting cement, uh, conducting electricity. But now, the, remember that my focus was on hydrophobicity in the first place. So how can we actually judge on this? Oh, so before I go to this, I can show you this uh, resistivity plot here. This is the resistivity, so a home meter, as plot, uh, uh, plotted as a function of the amount of carbon grains into the paste. So you see, it's in percent, all right, a few percent. And you see that there is a big drop. We, go to, we, we actually lose like six orders of magnitude or more when we go from the left to the right. So uh, we are very like resisting uh, the, the flux of electrons. So we are uh, insulator. Uh, and at some point, you have a certain drop of the resistivity, and now we're going to, to the scale of tens of a meter, and typically a good conductor. So, okay, so now we have a desk conductor, desk conduction, uh, conducting cement. And my, my point was to tell you about the hydrophobicity. So, for instance, here we can actually write the, the system. So, we impose an intensity and we measure voltage, and you, you will all recognize the Ohm law. U equal Ri, so the slope of that curve is actually the resistance or the resistivity. And you see that we do have a straight line. So this is actually the home row, yes, of course. And that tells you that actually we are dealing with electronic conductivity. If we were to have ionic conductivity so that the, the charge of the current would be carried by the ion swimming in the water, then that curve will be bent 
will be not a straight line. So the fact that with no drying conditions, that is as, as made uh, cement, we do have a cement that is hydrophobic. So that cement should stand uh, FT, a uh, freezing sewing effect, or cycling, or, and also ASR. So that's typically a droplet. You see that the droplet of water on that kind of uh, hydrophobic system, and it doesn't spread, right? This is typically uh, macroscopic testing of, I, I mean, showing hydrophobicity. All right. But doing this uh, cement containing, um, carbon containing cement, actually, so for the sake of, uh, of, uh, of mitigating freezing and ASR, Actually, we found out that there, is an inter there are interesting goodies coming up with, with that, that, uh, that new, new device, i say. For instance, if we polarize those small cement cylinders with a voltage of 30 volts, we do see an immediate increase of the temperature, of the surface temperature of the cylinders by 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5 degrees, for instance. So that we can actually think of that cement as an interesting, uh, how to say, uh, salt-free de-icing de pavement well, okay, for not too too cold conditions, of course, obviously minus 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 five, minus seven, or something uh, Celsius, for instance. Um, but also, uh, if you want to use it inside the house, it could be a delocalized heating system where all the walls uh, or the or also the slabs will be actually providing heat and heat with no in need of any pipe of water or circulation and so on and so forth. This is a straight like uh, surface effect of any, uh, due to the increase of temperature because of, the, of, the, of the, um, the way carbon behaves in terms of managing temperature. So now, so we have added this new property to, 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 to cement. All right, so when you have a, a actually a uh, conducting cement, uh, I told you that uh, the conduction is because of those carbon right grains those carbon grains are actually also porous so they can store ions okay coming from an electrolyte all right so by doing uh, so if we, if we we can actually conduct electronic store ions we are very well placed to actually to design uh, to, to design uh, electrodes all right so if you do two of them and you put them uh, you put in between a separator which could be a, a, a kind of a paper like a kitchen paper you, you put uh, some electrolytes in this paper, so you have some NaCl in between, and you polarize the system. So one electrode to the, uh, to the minus, uh, one, uh, the other one to the plus. Obviously, the ion in the electrolyte will be attracted, in the plus ion to the minus electrode, the minus ion to the plus electrode. And so then you then create a, a actually supercapacitor. So now, okay, this is a non for pure carbon. But in this case, actually, the supercapacitor is what we call a structural supercapacitor because actually the carbon grains are entrapped into the cement paste. So we have a very rigid, that could be a gigantic supercapacitor. So many, basically, we can actually turn a slab into a supercapacitor to store electricity, for instance, coming from a, a, a solar panel. So this is actually the proof of the capacitor effect. This is the current as a function of the voltage. And actually, this is the capacitor that we've measured. Uh, up to now, it's typically a 20, 30 millifarad per centimeter square, so the square of the cylinder, okay? And actually, uh, talking to, to the members of the group yesterday, we can, actually now we are more on, on the scale of 100. So we have improved, actually, the design, and actually, uh, we have 100 millifarad per centimeter square, which is pretty, pretty good, actually, okay? So this is how, actually, we came up with the first actually uh, uh, patent on this that is uh, that was uh, actually a, a, a momentum project that was carried by Katarina Yuanidu, she's a member of of, uh, of, of the hub and the, the CRS lab at MIT uh, that, that worked uh, jointly with the hub, and we could actually um, actually uh, put uh, file this first patent uh, with uh, the idea of doing supercapacitor uh, made out of conducting cement, meaning cement uh, loaded with nanocarbons, nanoporous carbons. So the idea, for instance, would be that obviously the supercapacitor, the structural elements, slabs, for instance, will be fed by some solar panels on the roof of a house. And actually, we may think of, uh, of uh, an, an energetically autonomous house, in the end, right? Where actually the electricity is actually stored in all structural elements. So that might be the dream, but that's where we were trying, we are trying to, uh, to, 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 to move to, towards. All right, now I'm coming back 
to the fact that the cement industry is very much CO2 uh, intensive and it's a very CO2 intensive industry. So here you have a little sketch. I mean, uh, uh, okay, the, the the chemical plant here is maybe a, a cement plant, but okay, it doesn't look this way, but fine. What we know is that it has actually because of the the high temperature in the kiln and because of the uh, cooking of of limestone, the whole thing, uh, the whole process. Uh, uh, as a very significant CO2 uh, burden in terms of loads. But, okay, CO2 uh, it can be seen as a problem if CO2 is released in the atmosphere. But if we were to actually capture or actually use CO2, so as not releasing CO2 in the atmosphere, but use it for, to, for doing something else, right, then we can actually develop a, a whole CO2, uh, I mean, uh, the cement industry would be at the base of a whole CO2 industry, okay? Now, I have a couple of slides to tell you that obviously when with our uh, carbon loaded cement, obviously these are CO2 sponge. So they're, they're storing uh, actually a pretty, pretty, pretty well CO2 actually. So now, okay, the question is what to do with CO2. I mean, are, they, are we going to some, uh, in a kind of later stage after this physical adoption of CO2 in the nanopores of, of the carbon? Are we moving towards carbonation of the cement base? That remains to, to, be, to, be, to be seen and demonstrated, right? But still, we have this adoption capacitance, uh, capacity of this uh, carbon loaded cement because of the nanopores of the carbon that are themselves trapped into the cement base. And you can store CO2, but you can do the same with uh, NOx, uh, so NO and NO2, for instance. But my point today is more like, let's go biotech. Back to school morning, you know that the most oxidized form of CO2, of, of carbon, is actually CO2. The most reduced form of carbon is actually methane. So if we were to kind of provide some reduced conditions to work we may actually uh, use CO2 to transform it into CH4, methane. Methane is a, is a gas, right? It's gas, right? I mean, I mean gas in the sense of, uh, you know, cooking gas, if you like. So that could be turned back to the kiln and actually uh, be used to actually heat the kiln. Very nice. How can we do this? Well, this is actually a long time. I mean, somehow, uh, recently, we have this uh, bio uh, reactor in blue here where you have maybe some algae and if you were to bring some some hydrogen and some co2 you can actually produce methane and back to the kiln fine but one do I, what i want to introduce today is actually the idea that we can actually use bacteria to actually uh, eat co2 and produce methane so let me just uh, uh, i mean get, get, get to this the slide here. So the idea is that actually there are some bacteria, bacteria that actually work, do work well in reduced environment. So if you, and, and they will uh, be fed by CO2 and they will produce methane. And to provide those reducing environments in terms of electrochemistry, right? The 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 the, the uh, you need we need to actually give those bacteria a bit of electricity. So. So this is an ongoing discussion with, uh, with some kind of uh, biotech uh, um, uh, spin out of MIT, Lab Central uh, here. Um, uh, the idea will be to grow bacteria on our carbon, conduct, carbon loaded conducting cement. So we can provide electricity, the reducing conditions. On the top of this, uh, that will be the, the, the bottom of the swimming pool, if you like. There will be some liquid with bubbling CO2 into it, dissolved CO2 into it. The bacteria will eat the CO2 and they will uh, bubble some methane molecules. And actually, it's interesting because if you, okay, the methane could be sent back to the kin, to eat the kin, or if you can actually start a new chemistry, a new kind of uh, chemistry, because part of the methane can you look back and if you into the solution, and actually you can start producing more advanced molecules like acetate at a rate which is way larger than any, any, any never seen before. So you see, by uh, introducing these biotech ideas, uh, using bacteria to eat, to use the CO2 produced by the cement plant, because they're growing on the substrate that, that can actually conduct electricity, so obviously I'm referring to our uh, carbon containing cement, then we can actually may have a way to produce methane out of the CO2, all right? Okay, 
So this is my last slide. You know that in the 70s, at least in Europe, I'm, I'm French after the war, I mean, cement um, and concrete was to actually add a lot of social meaning because we actually sheltered the old European uh, I mean, population into new buildings. And actually, obviously, uh, that was uh, concrete was associated with a sense of progress. But obviously, concrete has lost that thing because there's a sense of progress because of, of degradation over time. And also because now in the context of the climate change, we, I mean, because of the CO2 emissions are, 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 are linked with the production of the cement sack. But now, if we are to add cement based new functionalities like storing electricity, like heat, for instance, and if we can actually mitigate durability, increase durability of cement by mitigating freezing, sawing effects, or ASR, I think uh, really that the cement uh, per se, or the concrete actually, can regain can regain its appeal in the, in the context of climate change. And this is very much the challenge of the literature on the science part for the next phase, actually. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Great. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Roland. Appreciate it. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, or maybe for those of you who joined us late, there's a question and answer box in the lower right that you can use to uh, type in any questions that you have, because uh, we have everyone muted because uh, there's so many callers. So, so feel free to do so. Um, in the meantime, um, Roland, I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit more. You know, as, as uh, you mentioned that you know it's, there have been other solutions that have been proposed uh, about um, you know multifunctional concrete, but the economics of them haven't always really been appealing, which is maybe why we don't see them a bit more. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about how. Um, the, you, you know why what it is that you're pro you're proposing here you expect to be much more economically competitive okay that's actually a good point actually when I say porous nanoporous carbon actually this I mean could be black carbon actually these are of the same kind of um, low value in the sense of dollar per gram or per kilograms as, as uh, I mean as cement actually this is interesting because obviously the same thing will can work will work with with carbon nanotubes for some of those fancy carbon nanotubes or graphene flakes, but the the value of those is more like a thousand dollars per gram. Remember that uh, cement. I mean, uh, I think it's five cents of the pound, right? Is that some, uh, some that kind of price? So you cannot mix something of the value of one thousand dollars per gram with something that has a value of five cents of a dollar per pound. See, this is crazy. I mean, this is uh, the, the contrast is too large. So that could be. In our case, the, the nanoporous carbon things are very much, I mean, very cheap. So they, and they are available. They are byproducts of, of some industry, or they are also produced by some chemical companies, obviously. But um, typically, I, I heard that that uh, WR Grace actually linked with, for instance, uh, um, uh, the production of those nanoporous carbons and so on. So this is something that is very, uh, very much available on the market for, for uh, I mean, good price. I mean, for cheap price. Great. That's that's really helpful. What do you think are some of the challenges? Right right now, you've been working a lot with uh, cement paste. What do you think are some of the challenges associated with, um, you know, scaling this up to concrete? Well, well actually, you're absolutely right. For now, we have the cylinders I was showing you are actually pure cement. I mean, pure Portland cement, by the way, Portland cement. At least this is the real one. But the, obviously, the scale, the idea is now to scale up and to go from a little cylinder of three centimeters in size, in size, sorry, to a slab of one meter square, for instance, right? And obviously, not in pure cement, but adding some sand, so we're going to do more flour with this. So, but the idea is really that the cement is well dispersed into the blue of the mortar, so it, it will conduct electricity, obviously. But then we need to actually show, I mean, you know, the, the real thing. But it should be no problem in the sense that the, conduct the conductivity of cement, the electrical conductivity, is really ensured by the glue phase, by the CSH phase that is actually gluing the sand grains together. So we should maintain this. But okay, that remains to, to be done. And we actually have hired a, 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 a postdoc from, from Sherbrooke in Canada to, to do so actually with us, this Nancy. That's great. 
All right. Um, uh, just just waiting. We got got some comments that uh, what you presented was interesting, but no no additional questions right now. I wonder if um, you could talk a little bit more about the whole uh, methane. Uh, capture and transforming that you, you know some, some of the the organisms that are used to uh, eat this co2 have been applied uh you know when with people just talking about um you know algae and and uh, other organisms like that being applied in the, the energy sector what do you think would be some of the unique aspects of applying this to cement production that would differentiate it from some of the other things that we see in the in the energy sector Okay, so I mean, for, I mean, this algae idea is it's been on. I mean, it's been around for for, for a long time now. Okay, and yeah, actually, people are actually producing those. Actually. But the thing is that we need that to work working with those bacteria, as I understand, because I'm not yet an expert on this, but uh, they are like producing. Uh, I mean, eating CO CO2 and producing methane at, at a very large rate, better than any like uh, plant based thing like algae, because there is uh, like uh, bacteria. So. When I say that a swimming pool, maybe we're going to start by doing a petri uh, uh, batch. You know, this is uh, uh, just to show the fact that actually th those bacteria can actually grow on the surface of our carbon-loaded uh, uh, cement. All right. So uh, those, when I say reduce conditions, this is um, given by the fact that we can polarize them by bringing electricity. So uh, apparently, I mean. On the paper, at least, because again, this is a, 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 an idea for phase three, actually, the, but this is uh, on the paper, it looks like very appealing. So we, we need to actually uh, uh, figure out, for instance, uh, the, the pH conditions of those bacteria. Are they okay with being in a basic environment? But apparently, yes. So, let, let, I mean, this is really a, a, um, a question of starting a, a, a new avenue of, of um, what I call going biotech, uh, where the cement industry can be actually taking care of the CO2 on the cement plant straight. Got it, got it. Okay, that makes sense. All right, well, it looks like we don't have any other uh, additional questions, so I think we'll uh, wrap it up then. Um, for those of you who want to listen to this again, we're going to uh, be putting it on YouTube, and of course, you can also go to our website at cshub.mit.edu um, to find additional information about our research and uh, find out ways to be in touch with us. So thanks so much, everyone, for joining, and we look forward to seeing you on our next uh, webinar. Bye-bye. Okay.